Hi, it's Gabby Reese, and this podcast is powered by Laird Superfood. It was created in our kitchen by my husband, big wave surfer Laird Hamilton, and it all started with a simple idea. What began as Laird's secret for long-lasting energy on the waves is now Laird Superfood, offering a full range of delicious plant-based creamers, coffee, greens, and more. Visit LairdSuperfood.com and use the code GABBY2024 and save 20% on your first order. You can work from the road while turning your vehicle into a powerful high-speed data Wi-Fi hotspot with AT&T in-car Wi-Fi on a network that covers more roads than any other carrier. Connect up to 10 devices and stream conference calls. Finish up that presentation or answer last-minute emails. Go to att.com slash in-car Wi-Fi to see if you're eligible for a free trial today. Based on independent third-party data, always pay careful attention to the road and don't drive distracted. Wi-Fi hotspot intended for passenger use only when vehicle is in operation. Compatible device and vehicle required. Welcome into an all new episode of Her Playbook. I'm Madeline Burke. March is Women's History Month. And to celebrate, we are having a panel of incredible guests here at the New York Giants practice facility. Let's get into the conversation. We've got Gotham FC well represented on the stage. Uh, to my right is Carolyn Tish Blodgett. She is a co owner of Gotham FC. Uh, Yael Averbush, who's the GM of the team, and Eli Manning, of course, also a co owner of Gotham FC uh, and a familiar face around this building. Um, Thank you everyone for coming through for this conversation. And first of all, congratulations to the recent success of Gotham, uh, 2023 champions, strong start to this preseason right now. Carolyn, as a, as a recent investor in Gotham FC, what drew you to this club? Yeah, so obviously our family has co-owned the New York Giants for the last 30 years, but we wanted to see, you know, what are the next 30 years of sports going to look like? And so we started Next 3 again to have a front row seat um, to the changing world of sports. And we didn't go out, we really didn't have an agenda at first. We didn't go out and say like, okay, what's the next team we're going to go invest in? But it was pretty clear pretty quickly that sign after sign pointed to the the growth of women's sports, specifically the NWSL. Um, And then so we started looking into the NWSL and we met with a bunch of different teams teams and we both loved the team the current team obviously loved the other owners on the cap table um but it was it there were it was clear that this team was was moving in the right direction and we were we would um really support where we could help support where they were going and then we also thought about just for our own family the fact that we've been you know new yorkers through and through and the idea that we could come into the New York team just felt like an opportunity we couldn't pass up. Right. And you mentioned the other owners. Eli, you had already been an investor at that point. When you made the decision to invest in the Women's Soccer League in Gotham FC, what drew you to that? It was really a personal decision for me. Uh, you know, Growing up in New Orleans, my dad was involved with the New Orleans Saints, and, and I grew up going to Saints practices and going to games, and, and I was interested in sports and to see firsthand those athletes and Bobby Bear and Ricky Jackson and Pat Swilling and these guys are my heroes and got to see them play on Sunday and get to meet them. I was trying to do the same thing with my, my three girls and they were very un- uninterested in Saquon Barkley and Odell Beckham and <laughs> Daniel Jones. And so they, they did. And so for me, it was uh, all of a sudden seeing, having the opportunity to, to not only invest in and help grow a game and for the women's sports, but all my girls are athletes to have them go to practice and, and see the role models and see people that these are girls that are playing a professional sport. Uh, they get to watch them on TV. They get to go to a game. We went to the championship game in San Diego and see 40, 50,000 people cheering for them. And that, um, you know, that just wasn't around when I was growing up. There were, you, there were zero women's sports on TV. You didn't get to, even if you played a sport, you didn't get to see someone else doing it and get to, you know, have a card or anything. So I think to create that um, environment, that atmosphere, that, that those experiences, for my girls to go to practice and meet these unbelievable athletes and get to hang out with them and, and just for them to see that, hey, playing a sport is is cool, it's awesome, and if you want to pursue that, do it. If you want to pursue other things, we'll, 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 we'll go that route also, but th- just want to know that they have that option and that, um, you know, that they can meet and, and have role models. Uh, it was, was really special for me. Yeah, well, and you touched on the growth of the women's game as well, and Yael, you're currently the GM of Gotham FC but you also played professionally. How have you seen the evolution of women's soccer in your time involved with the game? Yeah, so hi, everyone, first of all. And I I see a Gotham sweatshirt, so I love that. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm from the area, grew up in Montclair, so very close to here. Um, always dreamed of playing professional soccer as a young kid. And what I thought I was dreaming of was that I was going to show up in a training facility like this. I was going to play in the stadium right over there. And I saved all my cleats because I thought they were going to be worth millions of dollars one day. And my experience as a player was not quite like that. Um, I did um, get to a, a pretty high level in the game. I have experience with the U.S. women's national team. I played professionally for 10 years. And what was called Sky Blue FC, which was the previous name of now Gotham, was my first professional club as a player. So in a lot of ways, I feel like I've come full circle into this role as general manager, but just to give everyone an idea of where the women's game is coming from and how quickly it's progressed is when, when the league started, I believe the minimum salary was $7,500. And I was just sharing with Carolyn, actually, to give everyone an idea of, you know, it is rapidly professionalizing. And if you watch it on TV now and you see and you come to Red Bull Arena, you see and you feel something that is definitely um, a, a really young professional sport, but it feels professional. It's really exciting. There's a lot of attention on it right now. Um, but in my 10th year as a professional, which was uh, 2019, I, my salary was $21,000, and I thought that was good. And I had to start a business on the side because I couldn't just play professional soccer. Yet, I was a national team player, and I was probably in my, the top, you know, whatever, 1% of my field in my position in the game. So uh, now to be able to be part of, um, alongside the support of these wonderful people, leading the vision of making this something close to what I dreamed of as a young kid has been a really special journey. And so that's kind of my vision is to come back and hopefully create something for the up and coming players that is what I wished I would have had on myself. Right, and you talked about the rapid professionalization of the sport, of the league. You know, Carolyn, you and I were talking about this a little bit too. And you know, the casual soccer fan might say, oh, NWSL is the you know, comp to the MLS. But globally, when you look at how it's perceived globally as a league, how would you describe where the NWSL stands? Sure, I can start, but I think Yale should yeah. probably answer this question. Um, so what, uh, yeah, for, so for the casual fan that may not realize that the NWSL is the number one women's soccer league globally. And that means we have the best talent, we have the best product on the field. And so when I can maybe just answer from the business side and then Yale should jump in on the player side. We, um, as a league, are doing everything we can to maintain that. You see a lot of the European leagues starting to focus on the women's game and, and starting to you know, try to up their game as well. But it is really important to us that we have the best, we continue to put the best product on the field. Because then when I think about this on the business side, that's how we are going to, to grow our fan base. We, if we have the, I think about when I was at Peloton, we had the best product and then our job as marketers was to go create a great fan, consumer experience around it to get people you know, into, into the fold and, and become Peloton members. If you think about it from Gotham's perspective, we have the best product on the field. We have to do everything we can to maintain that, but then we also have to go create a great fan experience so that people want to show up and show up and, and tell all their friends. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on that a little bit. So soccer-wise, it's really interesting because we've been the front runners in women's soccer. You know, our, our U.S. national team has won the most World Cups. When you look at the world stage, everyone is looking at the U.S. as the leaders. Yet we are behind culturally as a country in soccer because we don't have the Manchester United, the Chelsea, the Barcelona, the brands that everybody knows and loves, that people are wearing jerseys all around the world, kind of like the Giants um, brand in that sense. So what we're trying to do at Gotham and in NWSL is essentially create that level of, of a brand and something that people love and associate with success or whatever it is, their family traditions. Um, that obviously, because we're so new to it, unlike you know, some of the women's teams that are associated with the men's teams that have those big brands, have piggybacked off of some of that, some of the methodology even on the field. So we're essentially building that from scratch and that's what we're aiming to do at Gotham. We really have a big vision of you know, when people think of women's soccer in the world, can they think of this logo? Or when, when someone sees this logo, what do they think of? Rather than thinking of Barcelona, which may be in the soccer world on the men's side, you see everywhere, can we make Gotham that? So that is really the vision. It's an interesting, we're in an interesting place in the world of soccer because it is a global sport that we as a country are coming in on kind of late. Well, and just following up on that as well, you know, you look at the way that you guys have built this this team, this franchise, the style of play that you guys call organized chaos a little bit, and the success that you've had recently in free agency. How has winning and the recent success of the team um, changed that approach, or how has your approach to the game uh, allowed you to garner such interest from free agents? 
I think because, because of where women's soccer is and where, where we're coming from, what the athletes experience on the field is so sacred. And I think this is true. This is true for all professional athletes. Is, and in the women's game, there are not so many places that you can go and know that you're going to get absolutely excellent coaching, excellent preparation to feel the satisfaction of all the years of work you've put into your craft that you can as a professional feel that you're getting fulfillment in being the professional player you want to be. It's very rare in the women's game. If you were to survey all the women's soccer players around the world who are playing at the top of the game, it's very rare that someone would say, yeah, I feel like I've made it. I'm getting everything I need. So our focus is to be able to hopefully provide an environment that does that. And we focus first on our our, our head coach, um, Juan Carlos, he's Spanish coach. He is unbelievable. He's the best I've ever seen. And so what we hear from players and what I think is true for all professional athletes, the top ones all still want to get better. Nobody who's a top top pro and going to be good still is like, okay, I'm, I'm fine how I am. So they all want to get better. They're really competitive. They want to win and they want to do that surrounded by people who share that culture and that drive and that vision. So really, um, what we were able to show through last season and through Juan Carlos's leadership and the conversations we had with the free agents is if you truly want to still get better in your career and you want to be in a culture where we are going to be relentlessly competitive and trying to win and reset the standard in the women's game through what we're doing on the field and off, uh, you have to come to Gotham. If you care about something else, if you want a bigger paycheck or you want nicer weather, you can go somewhere else, no problem. But that really appeals to players. And so we were able to bring in a lot of very exciting players. And having the franchise be felt by the fan base is an important thing. Eli, I know that you are aware of like what it feels like to walk out and have the New York Giants be felt and have your presence be felt. And as a you know investor and a part owner of this club, how have you seen that grow for Gotham? And also, what kind of steps can you guys take to continue to grow as women's sports as a whole continue to rise in viewership and popularity? Yeah, well, it's been great to see just in the last you know, the three years I've been involved that now there's a new TV deal. And so, like, that, obviously, we know from in all sports, that's, that's important. That's where money is. That's where you can pay more, you know, the players a higher salary cap. To, so to see the you know, game grow, that's more people watching the game. Um, it's still, I think it's about creating that great fan uh, experience when you go to the game. And I know my, from personally taking my kids and going to the games, they love the, uh, the access. You get to see the players, you're close to the field, um, and, in, in, and just about having a great game and a great product out there. And I think that's what they've you know, talked about. This is the best women's soccer league. And so you're getting to see the best players. You're following the people on social media. So getting just more kids, parents, everybody in this area um, just you know, to support, to come to the games. And I think they're doing a great job at Gotham of creating that great uh, fan experience. So more people are, are coming and checking out the live games, but and, you know, and then more access to find it on TV. And um, you know, got to go bring a couple of my kids to the to the championship game in San Diego. It's hard for me to go to San Diego. I thought I might, you know, people might come after me, but it's all <laughs> still too soon. All, all good, all good. No, it was great. And uh, but to see that atmosphere, I mean, it's it, and you're not playing a San Diego team. That was a Super Bowl. That's like the that is the site of the championship game. And so uh, fans from whether both teams or just fans of, of the of the league and of soccer were all there to cheer it on. So that was a, a really special experience. And to continue to grow those events and then your home games is, is I think, where, uh, you know, we're trying to you know, create that and, and to help uh, just, you know, grow the game in that way. Absolutely. And Carolyn, you touched on this too. Your time as head of global marketing at Peloton, that experience and the way that you've guys grew Peloton into such a household name. How has that helped you in this role? Yeah, when we uh, came into Gotham, I don't think any of us appreciated how, how many parallels there would be between kind of the early days of Peloton. When I joined, there were 30,000 members. Awareness was like 1% um, to where it was. By the time I left, it was over a, bil over a million, million members, 1.2 billion, I think, in revenue. So that, that trajectory is actually very similar to where we hope Gotham will be. Um, we're not there yet. So when I think about you know, what were those things that made Peloton really successful, again, um, were number one, as I said before, we had the best product. We, knew, we were really confident we had the best product, but we had to go create a consumer experience so that you would 
start using the product and you were never going to churn, right? You were never leaving once you were, once you were a member because it was such a great experience. And by the way, you were going to tell all your friends about it because it was so great. Um, we have that opportunity with Gotham. We know we have the best players on the field. We have, we put the best product on the field every week. How do we go create, as Eli said, that great fan experience around it so that you show up to a game and then you can't wait to come back and you can't wait to tell all your friends about it because it was so great. The second piece um, that Eli mentioned as well is the, the star power of the players. And um, when you think about Peloton, you probably think about Ali Love or Robin or Cody, and you know it's that connection you have with the instructors. Our players are stars, and we have an opportunity to help them go build their personal brands and, and build connections with our fans so that when you think of Gotham, you think of coming to see Rose Lavelle or Crystal Dunn or Tierna Davidson or any of the other players. So we have a big opportunity there. And then the third piece, um, for anyone that is, is a member of the Peloton community, you probably know the Peloton community is kind of the, the best kept secret of Peloton. Um, it is the, re you, you joined potentially because it was COVID, you needed to exercise, you thought you were buying a product, you didn't realize you were joining this, this deeper community of like-minded people. Gotham's really the same way, and you probably, you're wearing your Gotham sweatshirt, you can probably attest to this, that you think you might be going because it's a great soccer game and your kids love soccer, you love soccer and you want to go watch it. You don't realize, you, once you go, you are joining a community of like-minded people. And you are, these are people that are passionate about teaching their kids about what women's sports can look like. These are people that just love this sport. These are people that are looking for other people like them. And, and so we have an opportunity, the, the Gotham community is really small right now, but we have an opportunity to take that community that is so loyal and so rabid and grow that as well. I've got to say, I've been to a couple of games. It is so much fun going out there, and it's fun watching the crowds continue to grow every time you're out there. It's like, wow, there are so many people supporting this team so fervently. Um, before we let you guys go, I want to open it up to the live audience here. If anyone has any questions for Eli, Yael, or Carolyn, uh, would love to get questions from. Uh, all right, Yael, this one's for you. You spoke about how this is a full circle moment being a GM now of this club and you started off being a kid, wanting to play soccer, having these goals. We're seeing the NFL now, a lot of players become becoming coaches, and not just coaches, successful coaches. Can you talk about how your experiences throughout life being an athlete have translated and separated Gotham from the rest of all the other clubs? Yeah, very good question. And I think we're seeing it in women's soccer as well. Like, So when I started this role as a general manager, I'm coming up on two and a half years, uh, the other GMs I was calling and meeting were not people who looked like me. They were not people from the same background as me. I actually was unclear on why they were doing the job a lot of times. Um, and now I get to, you know, we go to a league meeting and I get to reconnect with all different people that I played with or was coached by. And, and it is a group, there's a group of former players now, I think, I believe there are six or seven former players as general managers in NWSL right now. And I think we're seeing it, like you pointed out, in, in NFL and other sports as well. I think, you know, when I, there's, there's a lot I have to learn, uh, that much more I have to learn than what I feel like I know already that I can bring to the table in this role. But I think the most important thing that I come back to is in looking at how we need to grow the game and what we need to do for Gotham to be successful, it's very overwhelming. There are like I even, I walked in here, I had about three conversations, I looked at this and I was like, what? We have a lot of work to do. Um, but I do think that from a player perspective, I know what is the most important things and what things can never be sacrificed and what things will make it a place that people wanna be, come to play and come to work and what will inspire people to be part of the vision. And I think anytime you're doing something that you want to be the best in the world and you can pinpoint what can make you the absolute best or make you different or allow you to redefine the industry, those are really exciting things to be part of. And that's what I know because I know of my experience, what inspired me to show up every day and continue to work hard even when other things weren't great. So I constantly call upon that knowledge and my connection with the existing player group to understand what are the things that can buy us time and patience to build everything else around us. And we're not perfect on it. We definitely have, um, we're not all the way there, but I think it's allowed me to prioritize in a way and, um, and hopefully buy us some time on everything else that we need to do. In terms of uh, grassroots development, um we played the first ever international game as the Giants, right? And, um, and were hosted by Chelsea. They had like 20 fields. They grew all their own talent. It was such a unique setup, right? Um, can you just talk about grassroots development, youth participation, 
the league's efforts in that uh, area, your local efforts in this uh, in this market, and kind of how that all feeds into the growth of your team? Sure. Yeah, this is a huge area of focus for us. Um, it is not currently being done very well in soccer in our country. I think um, the other uh, other areas like around the world have really pinpointed a specific aspect of talent identification and how you identify and develop the future professionals that we've, to be honest, um, no one's really nailed on the women's side. I think we're starting to get it on the men's side. Um, but the differentiation of allowing that clear pathway, I think is very important in then making the game fun and rewarding for the people who might not totally get into that journey. So um, there's a lot of room to grow in terms of, I think, making people general fans of the sport. So we have a lot of families in the US who their kids play soccer because they want their kids to get a college scholarship or they think their kid's gonna be pro. The second they're not on that trajectory in that journey, soccer's not really that interesting. They'll go do other things. It's another activity. It's not worth their time or investment. Whereas in other countries, you play soccer because you're gonna watch the game on the weekend with your family and it is everyone is focused on if Chelsea's gonna win and it's everything and everyone's gonna be in a bad mood if they don't. And I think there's a really, um, important cultural piece that we're starting to get. And, and I think the U.S. is starting to latch onto, and hopefully at Gotham we can kind of um, redefine how that looks in the U.S. by creating a true cultural impact where players want to play the game because they love the game and they're involved in the game and it's a family experience. And that way players will stay involved even if they don't make the A team or don't get the college scholarship. You know, we see so many players fall off at the grassroots level because if they're not a lead or if they can't pay the many thousands of dollars to participate in the elite team. It's like, why would you do it? Well, there are many reasons that you should want to do it. And I think we're getting there, but there, right now I think we have an opportunity through Gotham to do it a little bit differently and do it really well. So it's a huge focus of ours on how do we embark on that journey, which we haven't yet really started to as a club. One other thing um, that I would just add to that is when we think about fandom, so if you think about it, I don't need to tell any of you this, obviously, about the NFL fandom, but often it's generational. You know, your grandparents were a fan of the Giants. They pass it down to your parents, and then they pass it down to you, and, you know, season tickets get passed through families. We have an opportunity with Gotham and with women's soccer in general to really kind of rewrite that script and have it be from the bottoms up. So if you think about the, the growth of youth soccer, Eli's kids play, well, I don't know if they play soccer, but whatever, they play sports. And then, and then that made Eli become a fan, right? And so we have an opportunity to really take, to really grow the game at the grassroots level and help have the, the youth that are playing actually get their parents and their grandparents to, be, to become fans. So we're really thinking about the youth development, both from a player development perspective, but also from a fan development perspective. From the business side, how have brands come in to help grow Gotham and then also help improve or be a part of the fan experience? I can start that one. You guys can jump in. Um, so one of the, I didn't really touch on this before when, we, when I was think, talking about the investment, but one of the, the reasons that we were excited by this investment is because for so long, women's sports have just been ignored. So from a, from a, fan, from a fan perspective, from the media perspective, as Eli said, from a business perspective, 99% of investments in sports goes to the men's game. That is starting to change, and you are seeing brands for the first time go, you, I, the early days of brands getting involved in women's sports were the sort of like, ah, I like sleep better at night because I supported, you know, I gave $10 million to the men's team, and then I wrote this like small check to a women's team, and then I feel better about myself. That conversation's really shifted now, where we have brands coming to us and saying, we are taking our dollars that need to have a return on investment, there's a clear ROI, and we are putting them to the women's game because there's a, again, there's a clear return on that investment. That's a really different conversation and a much more sustainable conversation. And that's how, if you think about like, how is the women's game gonna continue to grow and not just kind of be buzzy for a while, but actually become a sustainable business and continue to be one of the best leagues in the world. It's because brands are going to realize that there is a real business case to be investing in it. We just had a sponsor. We just announced CarMax as our um, lead sponsor on our jersey. And when we were talking to them about the opportunity, I hope they would be okay with me sharing this, but they didn't, they didn't have a bigger budget, as most marketing teams don't come in magically with a bigger budget. But they were able to prove to their senior management that they, that they could pull budgets from other departments because, again, the return was there. We have to continue to have those conversations for, again, for it to be sustainable. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, um, all three of you, for the incredible insight on Gotham FC and wishing you continued success as the growth of the club and the sport and all that. Um, Carolyn, Yael, and Eli Manning, everyone. All right, I'd like to welcome to the stage now our next panel guest. He is the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of USA Football, Scott Hallenbeck. Thank you so much for taking the time. Great, happy to be here. Happy to have you. I mean, we've gone from football to football in a yes. football facility, yes. all, the, all the types of football. Um, of course, you know, the national governing body of the USOPC, um, USA Football, you lead USA Football. And a big news, a big piece of news is that uh, men and women are going to be competing in flag football in the 2028 Los Angeles Summer Olympics. How huge is that for the sport? Massive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're, this is just so interesting for me to be here. We're in a massive learning curve with, uh, with flag and how it's developing, and I'll try to put it in context for everybody. So I was sharing earlier, in many respects, people think of flag, and it's a recreational sport at youth, right? It's intramurals in college, and it's adult amateur beyond that. So we are literally having to build what we just talked about. I mean, how do you build off the success of the US, US soccer national team program these amazing things, right? There's no infrastructure to say, what is an elite 12-year-old or 14-year-old or 16-year-old or an adult in flag? So we're in the process of trying to build all of that. So with the incredible success of tackle football, of course, and all the great things going on around the world, um, I really applaud the NFL. I applaud all the NFL clubs the investment they're making, both seeing it as an international growth strategy, uh, but also what you're doing domestically here in every single state to grow this game is creating this massive influx of participants. Um, and the, the global pinnacle of sport is the Olympics. I mean, that's, that's the way it works. So to finally have football in the Olympics, one of the few sports that I can think of that does, hasn't also participated in the Olympics is just a massive opportunity for all of us. Um, and then in addition to that, this idea of inclusivity, right? So football, again, was one of these sports that mostly was male dominated. And now the floodgates have opened and the interest level from girls all the way up to women is scaling at a rate that I've never seen any sport or any discipline of a sport happen like that. So it's just, I mean, it's, it's incredibly cool. It's amazing for the sport. There's so many incredible opportunities. It's just, it's a really neat time. And, and what better than this month to talk about really the, the new history right, yeah. of, of football and the evolution of it. Of so it's, it's great. Of course, and Women's History Month Absolutely. and the growth of the yes. game as well. And, you know, you mentioned this, like, uh, the football fans might look at flag football as, like you said, a recreational sport, but flag is almost a different sport. And there are different types and categories. You talked about sevens and fives. For the casual football fan who might not be as familiar with flag as a sport, how would you describe the game? It's definitely a different game, um, and so we're at this sort of chaotic moment with the, the exciting scaling of the sport. There's a couple of critical things that need to happen. One is, I've shared like fives is the Olympic discipline. Mm -hmm. That's what the International Federation follows. Um, so that's set, that's concrete. And that's five on five. Five on five, yes. and it's a 50 by 25 yard field. So a small, tight, compact space. Whereas sevens right now, which in fairness has been around a lot longer. I, I didn't realize actually that Florida's been playing sevens for like 20, 25 years. But that's an 80 by 40 yard field and includes punting. Uh, the, the challenge at the moment is California, Nevada, uh, Arizona, apparently uh, New Jersey and, and New York are going to have different rules. So that just creates a bit of a chaotic environment for most importantly the parents and players who we want to bring up through the system as simply as possible. So the good news is the stakeholders, the high school federation, the state associations, the NFL are all coming together to say let's try to simplify that. That would make our job a lot easier because then we take a unified sevens rule and transfer you to fives, which is talent transfer. Um, we were talking about how on the men's side or the boys' side, uh, we want to be super careful and respectful because we focus on all of football development. So, you know, flag, non-contact, all the way to contact and, of course, uh, tackle. Um, you know, we don't want to do anything to sort of cannibalize that. In my humble opinion, we're just going to grow the pie. It's not really going to take away from tackle, just more boys are going to want to play. Uh, but on the girls' side, it is incredible to see not only the talent and the passion and the excitement, but they're coming from soccer and basketball and lacrosse and really you name it, track athletes. And at the adult side, it's, it's former Olympians, it's Division I athletes. So it's just 
It's filling in at a rate that, again, I've never seen. So most probably realize this, but there's already nine states that have girls' flag as a varsity sport, and that'll be 12 and 15 before we know it. There's already, I think it's upwards of 30 s colleges, NAI principally at the moment, that offer scholarships. So the almighty scholarship, good, bad, or indifferent, that's a driver. Um, and then we've already been in, as others, you know, directly with the NCAA about evolving that into what they refer to as emerging sport for women. Um, and that can be traditionally about a five, even a 10 year process. But there's so much excitement about this, they wanna get it done in a record time, two, three, four years to actually have colleges now offering scholarships. And we've been in meetings with the Big 12 and the MAC and you know, Division II and Division III. So it is, it is just incredible to see the growth. Right, and you know, the Olympics giving that kind of stamp of approval has gotta kind of set the tone for other governing bodies of the sport, correct? That's it, yeah. The, to have that as the pinnacle uh, and, and really building towards that is probably wouldn't happen without that. So that's, that's incredibly exciting and, and yeah, a, a critical piece to this overall development cycle. Yeah. And you know, when the news first came out that flag was going to be an Olympic sport, we heard you know, NFL athletes being like, I wanna play, I wanna raising their hand quickly. Um, you know, some positions it translates a little bit different than others. I know you and Eli were talking about this before we got started. Uh, how would you say, you know, number one, it translates in that way, but number two, it's almost a different sport. It's not like a grooming ground for the NFL for football. It's a separate sport, correct? Yes. So a good analogy there, or a good example, I think, would be when, um, and I worked for the U.S. Olympic Committee way back in the day, I'll date myself, I, when 92, when the Dream Team happened in Barcelona. Uh, the, the difference between an NBA game and an international FIBA game is modest, right? Modest rules. The difference between NFL tackle and our flag is literally night and day. So I wouldn't suggest for a second that NFL players aren't more than capable of learning this game very quickly. But as an example, again, the context, we're trying to learn what is that transitional process. We talk to owners and, and coaches and players like, okay, how much time do you really need of me so I can actually come play for Team USA? Trying to figure that out. But the defensive side is probably the biggest challenge. It's the flag pulling. That really is an art and a science. Um, offensively, a receiver, 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 they're gonna run incredible routes. Granted, it's a tighter space. Quarterback play will just be a tighter space. We need the combination of a Eli Manning and, and a very elusive, quick, fast-paced uh, quarterback. Not suggesting he's not. Oh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, you, you also talk, touched on finding talent and how it's been harder to kind of figure out how to identify talent at an early age. What is USA Football doing or how are some of the uh, programs that you guys have been implementing helping to grow the game from a young age and, and attract, you know, young fans and young talent? So a couple of things that I think, again, are really important. So, again, while this sport is scaling, um, it's also important to make sure we're we are being responsible as a governing body, and I think all of us together, to strongly encourage the tournament providers, the league providers, make sure you do have the right insurance, make sure you have coaches that are trained, make sure you have an emergency action plan. Put those safety best practices in place so it's just quality experience overall. That's yeah. first and foremost. In addition to that, we're literally building out with the, the likes of the US Olympic Committee, sport performance experts, you name it, nutritionists, mental health, all the professional things that you would certainly have in, in this building and, and really sport at large, we're trying to do that now, whether it's 12 years old or all the way to adults. So different challenge, because we have remote athletes coming from all kinds of different places, but that's the opportunities. How do we make sure on the front end we, put, we build a professional structure and pathway in the Olympic movement they call it high performance development? So we're in the process of doing that. An example will be on April 20th and April 21st, we'll have a talent ID and a qualifier here. So we'll have four qualifiers around the country. And US soccer is one of the best examples and one that we certainly follow and learn from. We're constantly asking, if you could do this all over again, what would you do differently? Important question, so we don't repeat mistakes. But we're, it's, okay, build a qualify structure, bring people in regionally, identify the talent, explain what are those qualities, skill sets, biomechanics, et cetera, that we need you to replicate so you can become a better athlete. Candidly, we're still figuring that out. We're learning as we go. But we're, we're constantly trying to learn from experts about how we do that. But there'll be talent IDs as a combination of a traditional combine, one-on-ones, five-on-five drills, 
it's where we can identify talent. It, we're the only ones that will bring scouts to those, so you actually have a chance to get into this pipeline. Um, so it's things like that that we're doing with different different NFL clubs, different markets around the country to both build awareness and to show a very professional approach to the sport. Well, and when you talk about, you know, identifying talent regionally, I still can't get over or I'm so confused at how different parts of the country have found different rules to the game. I mean, that must be so frustrating as a governing body. How does that happen? And how do you, you know, find a way to, to, the, to a middle point here? The, the, the positive is it's just growing so fast and yeah. everyone's really excited about it. So I think that will settle itself out. And okay. so the, that, that'll happen. But um, again, we, we're hyper-focused on fives. That's what we'll stay focused on. And, um, and just build the, I think once we get the high performance pathway clearly articulated and what's always a living, breathing thing, it'll always be improved upon. Mm -hmm. um, as we can share that information more it, through other things that we do, coaching education, uh, player development, a variety of other things that we do, uh, that will help, I think, streamline this and make it easier for everybody. Absolutely. Um, Scott, thank you so much. I wanna open it up to questions now here as well, if anyone has questions. Can you talk about, um the, the development model and how this changes, right? I mean, you've, you're, you've been trying to grow and uh, make the game a tackle healthy all the way from youth all the way to you know, high school. And now this is such a big change in operations, right? Like, how does that all fit together? You, you have a lot on your plate. Uh, can you talk about how you maintain your current operations? How does this all fit together and, uh, and how this changes kind of what you're responsible for on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, so first and foremost, USA football was heavily focused on what I'll just call the foundation of the sport, right? How do we, heads up football, health and safety, over 1.1 million coaches certified in the last 10, 11 years. So heavily focused on that, just making the game better. We don't run youth football leagues. As part of that, we again worked with the US Olympic Paralympic Committee to, to create what they call the American development model, we call the football development model, what everyone else in the world calls long-term athlete development, to, to first and foremost, look at our sport differently. So with many parents, frankly, saying, I'm not sure I want to put my child in tackle football yet, said, okay, we totally respect that. We want to give you entry points and options. So look at the sport, keep kids in football. So it, the football development model is a progression. Starts with non-contact, progresses to limited contact, progresses to full contact. We can teach you all kinds of requisite skills in flag football. Really great things that if and when you're ready, you will progress. Uh, so it, is, it, it has been extremely well received by tackle leagues that frankly we're starting to see real declines and now it's increasing their participation. More and more people are playing flag, they're going to what we call rookie tackle, which is a small sided game, six, seven, eight players, and then eventually to, to tackle football. Piece of good news, we just got data recently for the 23 participation year, and tackle is up 2%. We'll take anything at this point, right? Flag is skyrocketing. But positive news where, where there is more and more folks wanting to play football, so that's great. So really important, that's the foundation. And then from there, this does evolve our responsibility into what is more traditionally a national governing body role, which is build out the high performance plan, work with the infrastructure, leagues, tournaments, what have you, and try to get sort of everybody aligned and working together to ultimately produce the best talent and try to achieve what the NWSL is doing. There will likely be a professional league, both men's and women's at some point. Uh, but we want to be part of that process, much like, I guess, U.S. soccer probably works closely with NWSL and others, to, to create just a really strong ecosystem of development, health and safety, and all the things that should come with that so sport is being done the right way. With the growth of the women's and girls' um, flag football, are you seeing women coaching, being in leadership positions? Do you see heavy interest on that end as well? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think much like soccer, again, it's – we are strongly encouraging this sort of first wave of, of women and men players, mostly adult amateur players that we're pulling from and helping to become as sort of elite as possible. Um, they are very interested in now tra sort of transitioning. I mean, quite candidly, we're talking about, you know, 35 and 45 year old folks. So the natural next step is officiating is coaching, and so already in our, in our high performance plan and our coaching development plan, there is, there's opportunities for both. The other thing I should say, which we really like, is the US Olympic Committee requires 33% of athletes to be represented in everything you do within your governing body, so the board, every single committee, you know, the high performance committee, everything has athlete represent, 
representation, so both male and female. So there is a significant need on the women's side to have the, the, the right representation, people that actually know what they're talking about. And again, we're learning from them. We literally are learning, okay, what else can we do to help you be the best you can be? That's often the discussion. And exciting to see the growth of the game, men's and women's, and looking forward to the Olympic Games when we'll see it on the big stage. Scott Hallenbeck, thank you so much for taking the time thank today. You. Appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us today. For Scott Hallenbeck, for Carolyn Tish Blodgett, Yael Averbush, and Eli Manning, I'm Madeline Burke, and that's a wrap for our panel today. Thank you. This is where projects come to life. Our showrooms are designed to inspire with the latest products from top brands, curated in an inviting, hands-on environment, and a team of industry experts to support your project. We'll be there to make sure everything goes as planned, from product selection to delivery coordination. At Ferguson Bath, Kitchen, and Lighting Gallery, your project is our priority. Find great brands like Monogram at your local showroom or visit us online at ferguson.com build. Career Builder is made for people who have that thing. You know, those superpowers that make you good at your job, the skills you bring to work. And Career Builder knows those skills make you right for other jobs too. Higher paying jobs with benefits, jobs you never thought of trying. Are you a people person? Work from home as a customer service rep. Are you organized and like driving? Become a delivery driver. You have the skills it takes, and CareerBuilder.com has the jobs to get you hired fast. Visit CareerBuilder.com.